Psalm 6 and 2, quick verse of study here. I'm going to read one verse and move forward. The psalm is speaking David's professing of dependence upon God and upon him only for all good. It's easy to become dependent on, especially in America, on our wealth, on our, well, so-called safety that we have at this moment and truly waiting upon God. Nevertheless, however it goes, whatever difficulties or dangers he faces, he will meet his discouragements with the understanding that he will wait or be silent waiting on God to do what he is going to do. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Everybody say, for I am weak. O oh Lord, heal me for my bones are vexed. You can be seated. There's a verse of scripture that I've, I actually have a message that I teach entirely out of, out of this verse. And it's in the middle of a, a discourse or dialogue uh, at the calling of Nathaniel when Philip comes to him. And there's a moment here. And just prior to Jesus speaking to Nathaniel and making a tremendous statement about him, and Nathanael said unto him, listen to this, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> well, maybe there's some here that doubt too. Maybe you've forgotten that he's Jesus of, can anything good come out of Nazareth, folks? Yeah, Philip saith unto him, come and see. We've got to live a life of come and see. not of perfection, not of success, not of financial stability, not of social status, but a little life that points to Jesus. Come and see. That being said, I want to speak for a moment on the strength of weakness. The strength of weakness. Matthew 26 and 41 declares, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I've touched on this uh, for a number of weeks now. What it's saying is, uh, uh, and I'm kind of playing Captain Obvious here for a moment, if that's okay. Uh, don't, well, do you get fired up to accomplish great things for God on Sunday only to revert back to who you've always been on Monday? You long for the change. You get in the presence of God and, and, and a Sunday you get fired up and you make statements of validation and, 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 and promise only to get up on Monday. I, I call it, you're leaping on Sunday and limping on Monday. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Well, there's a, a concept here about changing our habits, changing our, our, our what we do to start getting a different crop. So different, reap different. Replace what you normally do and do more spiritually attentive things. It's kind of Captain Obvious here, but let's all give a head slap. That's not what we're doing. Write down the thoughts that you think on Sunday. Write down the passions and the ideas and, and the prayers that strike you and the things that motivate you while they're hot and, and fervent in the spirit on a Sunday. And then when that Monday morning blues shows up and you, you just pull that paper out and refire yourself and pray those prayers again and, and substantiate those thoughts from your notes. Luke 7 and 28 says, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Okay, wait a minute here. What are we doing? Listen, Christians or Christianity, more than any other time in history, has sought to make God in their image. 
there's an element of human pride and we all suffer from it. Every one of us. It's a, it's a strangling effect on our spirit. The sad thing is a lot of us has become accustomed to our spirit and we think that's God. Therefore, we're strangled out from really getting a dose of God like we need. Are you hearing me? We create a savior that's a little more than a buddy that we want to tag along in our endeavors and we wonder why we wake up on a Sunday and go to a church and you get fired up to do something and then nothing ever changes and five years rolled by and you haven't improved or not more spiritual. You've got nothing of substantiation or substantial effect that you've done or accomplished for God. In fact, you look back over and it's the physical things that are of note. So, Let's be clear. When he's talking about weakness, he's not talking about repeated willful sin. He's talking about our natural struggles. If you are constantly and willfully making the same sinful choices in opposition to God's word, you're a sinner, not a saint. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I'm going to interject this here. This is a sermon for another day. But we don't live like this is a job interview for heaven. We don't. Jesus very clearly tells us to where to lay our treasure, very clearly tells us what to do with our life, very clearly has laid it out. But let's, can we be real? Can I say something really real? We don't live like that's true. Now, I'm not going to go into details. That's for another message coming down the pipe. But you need to be honest and go look in the mirror. And how much treasure have you laid up in heaven? You're so busy caught up in this treasure, you strangle the Spirit of God telling you, uh, it's looking a little anemic up here. <laughs> Can I get an amen from an honest saint of God? But if you're sincerely attempting to serve God, then in all honesty, I, I want this message to affect you. I'm being selective here. I'm not preaching for everybody today. I'm not trying to tickle anybody's ears today because I want to say no matter how many times you've fallen, how imperfect you are or failed, Romans 7, 19, Paul lets us know. Paul did a thing or two for the Lord. You know, he did a couple of things. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now he says that, but when you read his life, does, it, is that, does that fit? No, because though he recognized his battle, he didn't fail to fight it. We use this as a compound. Man, I can't stop myself. Paul did. Because he fought the fight. Ah. See, you, you, some of us have surrendered to our proclivities. Some of us have surrendered to our likes and our wants. And we've gone ahead and tabled the things of God under the pretense, well, I'm not going to deny myself. 7 and 21, he says, I find then a law that when I would do good, Evil is present with me. What's he saying there? Notice the option to do wrong is present, but the choice is still in your power to do what's right. He did not abdicate the choice. He emphasized it. Emphasized it. It's going to be there, but you got to fight the good fight in your mind, in your heart. Uh-uh, I want to do this, but I'm going to do what Jesus said. That's my whole message. Y'all stand, let's get at it. I'm just kidding. But it is. Some of us don't want to be honest about this right here. We got a lot of trophies and a lot of things in our life that we point to. Look what I did. The thing is, is Jesus is, is a, what have you done for me lately? If you don't believe me, go look at the parable of the workers. Go read your Bible. But sadly, we, we, we think that we can alter what Jesus meant we do now listen 
God does not demand sinners to do anything unless they want salvation. Those people, like, man, your church has too many rules. Oh, you're getting the cart before the horse. You've kind of messed up. That's kind of. <laughs> it's funny, people can act like they're married long before they get married, and they got no problem with that. But, the, well, I'm not going to go down that road. So, for the sinner's sake, for the saint's sake, God gave us his word to show us the right choices of the righteous. They're not rules for you if you're not going to follow him. They're rules for those that follow him. It's no different than any other entity or occupation that you choose to be a part of. Your job has requirements, time, effort, task, and conduct. You are going to show up and do what they ask you to do, when they ask you to do it, how they ask you to do it, wearing what they ask you to wear. Ain't no one belly aching about that. If you don't like those rules, go find another job. You don't have to work. In fact, start trying to change things and see how quick. Well, he ain't a team player. In fact, while we're talking about teams, you can't be a part of a team without wearing the right uniform, being at the practice at the right time, being at the game at the right time. There's not an entity or anything on this planet that you don't, if to be a part of, that you don't have to fall in line. Yet when it comes to the most important thing you can be a part of on the planet, I ain't going to tell me what to do. That's fine, sinner. Oh. I don't want to be a sinner. I endeavor to be a saint. Now listen, it doesn't matter what's happening. This is the wonderful thing about it. What you've been through, if you just follow the basic guidelines and do the good, you're going to be a part of it. There are some of the most amazing athletes on the planet that are not a part of a team because they can't, they, they mess up the locker room. You can't mess up the Lord's locker room. He said, man, these things are here to help you. They're not here to hurt you. Now, if you're a sinner and you don't want nothing to do with this, fine, it's not on you. Don't, go do your thing. But if you want to follow him, take up your cross and follow him. Mm-hmm. So, let me tell you something. Even the spirit of the world knows the difference. Even the evil spirits of hell know the difference. Acts chapter 19, 13 through 16. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, they knew the power was in that name. Saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached, which in other words, Paul calls this, but Paul lives a completely different lifestyle than us. It's pretty obvious. Are you hearing me? And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and the chief priest which did so. These are important people in their little group. Mm -hmm. And the evil spirit said, Man, you know you're in trouble when the evil spirit will pipe up. Jesus I know, and Paul I know. That ought to let you know if Paul had a plan of salvation, I want that one. Some of y'all run with that in the next Bible study you teach. But who are you? And the men on whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed them against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Next time you've got someone that gets all offended, want to leave the house of God and getting all, excuse my French, but getting all butt hurt, stop playing. You ought to tell you, stop playing church. This is for the saints. If you want to be a sinner, stop playing like a saint. Weakness is not the issue here. Choices are. Choices are. Because listen, Matthew 12 and 20, it says something. A bruised reed shall he not break. A smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. Wait a minute, unto victory? What victory? The victory of choosing to do right 
even though your weakness is present. I wanted to do that, but I didn't. Victory. I wanted a cigarette, but I didn't. That's victory. I wanted a good old heart, but I didn't. I wanted to do what I wanted to do, but I showed up at work instead. Victory. These are the simple victories that transform a sinner to a saint. You're weak, it's present, but you still did that which was right. It's the difference between a good employee and a bad employee. They ain't going to tell me. I'm going to get here when I want to get here. Well, you start off, and that's not a very good employee. I'm going to fix this how I want to do this. I'm going to stack this. I'm going to do this how I want. Well, you ain't going to work there, Brian. Why do we treat Jesus like that? Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? Psalms 51, verse 17. David speaking. David done messed up. He uh, wasn't living up to his calling. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. That's the last thing we want to demonstrate to people. We want to be proud. Every choice and everything I do is right. Come here, Jesus, my little puppy dog. We don't think that we got to get up in the morning and regard God. I'm just going to go about this and Jesus just needs to come along. A broken and a contrite heart, oh God, thou will not despise. Everyone, now I don't want to blow anybody's cover here, but every one of us has weaknesses. There are physical weaknesses, emotional weaknesses, relational weaknesses, financial weaknesses, intellectual weaknesses. Now you want to jump up and down and tell everybody about your strength. That's your pride. Stop and think about the comments that you say to people about yourself. That's your pride. There are things we can't do physically, emotionally, spiritually. We all have different weaknesses. The real issue then is not do I have weaknesses, but rather what am I going to do with my weaknesses? What are you going to do? You're in the house of God. You're in the presence of God. What do we normally do with our weaknesses? We deny them. Don't look at my prayer life. Look at my wallet. Don't look at my Bible study teaching. Look how good I look in a suit. Don't look at my outreach. Don't look at my life. Look how well I do when I'm singing or I'm preaching or I'm doing, doing this around the church. That We deny our, our weaknesses. We deny them. We even defend them. We coddle them. We excuse them. We resent them. But most of all, we hide them. I don't want anybody to see I got weaknesses, so if we're in a conversation, I'm going to point to my strengths. Then God comes along and says, you know what I want to do with your weaknesses? Wait a minute. Who? Is it, that, that's why, if you want to know why you're on the sidelines a lot of times spiritually, it's because you're too busy promoting your strengths that you're not honest enough to put your weaknesses and God says, okay, I, that's what I'm looking for. You want everybody to, oh, look at me, I'm a success. Yet it's that person crawling to an altar that God reaches in. All of a sudden, God, what, how is God? God says, I want to use those weaknesses. That doesn't make sense to us. That doesn't make sense to you and I. It doesn't. We think God only wants to use our strength. Look at me, I'm a good orator. No, I'm not a bad orator. But that's not of me. Because I can point back to a time when I couldn't even hold a conversation. I look back to the point that I had fried my brain so bad that I'm sitting there trying to have a conversation with my mother or, or an adult or my probation officer or whatever, and I could not. They'd be in the middle of saying something. By the time they got to the end, I remember the last three words, but I can't remember the first part. And I couldn't hold the conversation. I'd done some damage to myself, 
So when I get up here, this is God's glory, not Steve Crow. This is not mine. I don't care if it's finances. I don't care if it's abilities and talents or whatever. If you didn't do it, it was God. I give glory to God about it. But you have to give it to him. We want to come in and say, how can I? I can't, I'm just using what God, I can't give it back to him, it's his. <laughs> Isaiah 55 tells us something, chapter, chapter 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Can, can I help you here? You ain't even on God's level of thinking, so stop it. Tell your neighbor, stop it. Neither are your ways my ways. Stop thinking that what you're doing is what God would be doing. Ah, that was painful, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your smart. I want to let you in on it. It's not so secret, secret. God's smarter than us. I hate to hurt some of y'all's feelings, but most of the way we think <laughs> that he should do some things are exactly the opposite way that he wants to do it. The Lord doesn't want to work around your weaknesses. And he doesn't want to work in spite of your weaknesses. I want to work through your weakness. The power, the power of God in my life is that he took someone who ruined themselves and repaired them. He takes, he take a person that can't sing and can't play and yet she's leading music in this church. Your greatest thing that you think is your strength now, if you go back to the beginning of your life, you can see, well, look, if God hadn't pulled some strings, I really wouldn't be here. So you want to really stand there and take glory and stand proud in something God gave you? From Gideon to David, Esther to Mary, God doesn't choose the way we 1 Corinthians tells us, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Maybe you got too big for your britches and you got tabled because you messed up and misplaced your weakness and thought it was your strength. And the base things of the world, the things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Did you really write that check? Or did you just sign a piece of paper because God gave you? Did you really get up there and move an audience with that song? Or did you just use what God gave you? Yeah. Because I was weak, but I was made strong. I love the fact that God is an equal opportunity anointer. You read the Old Testament. You read David and Gideon and Esther and Ruth. God purposely works through weak people. Why? Because then it shows his power. God is not impressed with strength. We are. God is not impressed with talent. He kicked the most anointed, powerful singer, musician ever out of heaven. He ain't impressed. <laughs> I don't care how good your pipes are. I don't care how great you do. And we got a lot of, and lose out with God because they can hit a melody note nobody else can. God's like, I'm still waiting to be impressed. But if you'd have gone up there with the attitude, I want to give God glory for what he gives me. Oh, yeah. He's impressed with weakness. Zechariah 4 and 6 says, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And really, that's good news. Now, if, if, if this is not true of you, then you can just omit this, but most of us are not extraordinary people. Most of us don't have physical strength like a super athlete. I'm never, Hussein Bolt don't know my name. They don't know yours either. They don't label me or list me with Einstein. I'm not a particularly smart or extraordinarily intelligent individual. I don't have a super high IQ. 
most of us are just really normal folks. Everyday people. Imagine when God sees our heart and get kind of a little superfluous and we want to think we're somebody walking into the house of God. He goes, see, how long's a a year to God? How long's a day? So you're up in here acting all something. He's looking at yesterday going, well, you, you couldn't pull up your britches. And we want to walk around pious and thinking we're something in the kingdom of God. He's going, holy smokes, man. So I, I, deep down, I'm thankful that he's not looking for all the best people because 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 26, even Paul says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And God said, that's okay, because I don't choose to work through natural strength. I choose, choose to work through natural weakness so that my power can show through. So again, when we talk about weakness, we're not talking about sins, character flaws that you can change like overeating, impatience, greed, covetousness, or laziness. The weakness that he's referring to is any limitation in my life that I inherited or cannot change. There are all kinds of limitations like that. Some of you had some external circumstances you couldn't control. Unexpected setbacks, relationships and pressures within your family, emotional tendencies that you're pre predisposed towards, and some things that have just transpired in your life. And so you're this regular clay pot Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Oh, man, we got to change how we talk. Wait a minute. God's doing this. That word earthen is astrakinos. It's literally where they get the word oyster from. Now, I got lit on fire on this when I started thinking about, you know, the pearl and all that kind of stuff, but I'm not going to get all caught up in that. I want to stick with the clay. It literally means clay. In fact, it's a lot of roofs around here in, in, in Arizona are made out of that terracotta clay. They're wonderful if they're set in place and they just sit there and don't move. If you start moving around and if you drop one or bump them, well, they're about as worthless as you Hello? That's why it's so important to remain where God places you. Are you hearing me? Because the thing about clay and clay pots, they break easily. They're not indestructible. But more than that, every day, an everyday clay pot has inherited designs flaw. It's imperfect. We're just ordinary containers, but we have a great creator. We have a, a great God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In fact, God can use up, mess up, mess, use messed up people if they let him. It was so important that God got this message across that he sent his prophet Jeremiah to see this exact demonstration and the power of God. He said in Jeremiah 18 and 4, and the vessel that he made, because he said, go observe this. Go down to the potter's house, Jeremiah, and watch this and hear what I'm saying that I can do with people. The, the, the vessel that he made of clay was marred, where? In the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it as long as you're in, your, in his hands, he can fix it. As long as you're in his hands, he can do whatever he wants. Uh, 
Listen, let's, verse 6 in chapter 18 of Jeremiah. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter said the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in mine. O house, what's he saying? It don't matter how messed up. It don't matter how marked. It don't matter how weak in my Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. You can be remade, you can be fixed, and you can be used despite whatever weakness is in your clay. Even though we're weak, we can be made again. Hallelujah. The Bible not only tells us to admit our weaknesses, but I'm going to blow your mind. It even tells us to be thankful for our weaknesses. Oh, I know. You're a kid. Wait. You must be joking. See, because most people want to come to church and poof. <laughs> like magic, get rid of all your weaknesses. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to pray through, I'm going to speak in tongues, I'm going to spin around, I'm going to throw a $10 bill over my head or any offering, I'm going to walk out and, ha <laughs> ha, I'm impervious. No. It's not that the power of God don't work, it's you've got to start saying, hey Clay, we're going to change what this vessel's used for, we're going to get our hands in the hands of the potter. I know the last thing you want to hear from me tonight is telling you to be grateful for your weaknesses, when you're saying, wait, God, I want to be, I want to be free from them. Not thankful. Why in the world would anybody be thankful for their weaknesses? <laughs> Until I was afflicted, I went astray. One of the most dangerous things is to get comfortable. One of the most dangerous things is, I really don't have nothing to pray for. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty godly. I'm pretty spiritual. I, yeah, I kind of don't, don't have people. We walk around like this all the time. Well, yeah, you know, Pastor, you, you need to have me preach and teach and sing. You need to have me. Man, I'm still waiting to hear from God on that one, but uh, I, I mean, I'd be fine, man. Make it on time. Let, let me see your amen corner blow up with the move of God. Let, let, hello? And I don't say that because I'm better than you. I say because I know what weakness I got to deal with to make it in here on a daily basis. And I'm like, wait a minute. If you, if mm, let's be real, it's kind of like we treat them teenagers. They want to walk around. I can't wait to move out and get all my own stuff and do it. And then a month later, they're back in the house living with you. You thought you was. Are you hearing me? I want to say something. Your weaknesses are actually benefits. Hold on to them. Remember them. You don't have, don't go back to them. They're blessings in disguise when they're put in the right place. Remember Old Testament King Saul? He lost out when he lost the weaknesses that got him promoted. Mm -hmm. And Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, Start thinking, oh man, you want to instruct, you want to instruct, you want to tell. But let's be honest. Let, 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 let's look at the fundamentals. Let's look at the basics of things. When thou wast little in thy own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed the king of the Lord? Let me say this. We, you and I, have got to be careful that the American opulent opportunity doesn't turn into God's rejection. It's easy to look like you should be the chosen one by how blessed you say your life is. Are you hearing me? Because when you stop and think about it, originally, Saul was humble when he was chosen. 
he considered himself insignificant. He viewed himself as unimportant. God could use him, bless him, and make him a powerful king. But the problem was he didn't maintain that mentality. He got too big. He forgot where he came from. He forgot that, yeah, yeah, you know what? You was looking for donkeys when I called you, boy. In fact, you didn't find them. They was already back at dad's house before you figured it out, slick. So before you run around telling God how to do things, Remember, you couldn't even find a couple of donkeys. God's promotion, blessings, and authority rested on his life. It's amazing when God's principles clean up your life and, and you get this, you get this amazing. It's wonderful when God changes and cleans up a life. And such were some of you. That's all of it. That's a wonderful thing. Thank God that he cleaned me up and got me out of that pit and washed me and cleansed me and changed the way I talk and changed the way I, but I can't turn it around. I got here. I, oh, no, no. If it wasn't for the presence of God, the word of God, the Holy Ghost, the people of God, the church, all this would not be here. And slowly Saul forgot. And he changed his heart and focus and he literally destroyed his own walk, his own calling with God for the things of this world. He was too big to serve, so he was too small to lead. He lost his weakness and became lost. He lost what he really was. God, God's not going to kill your twin. He's not going to kill your old self. You have to. You have to turn around and say, I know I want to do this, but that ain't right. I'll do this. I've heard it before. I've heard young people. I've heard myself. I, I want it so bad. But that's pick up the cross. I can afford it. I got the time. I got. Have we forgotten where we were dug? Have we forgotten what our, what our desires and our flesh? Have we forgot? And have we traded what America provides to us at the cost of our calling? He literally lost his weakness being king. We, Lord, you be king. I'm just going to be Saul. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. But we forget that. We, we're so busy. Oh, I'm pastor. I'm above. Are you out of your mind? Slap yourself, lay hands on yourself, get yourself in your prayer room, Steve Crow, and get your act straightened out. Now, I know y'all won't talk to yourself like that. I, I, I do. I got to get up at dark 30 in the morning to make sure this boy lines up because I don't know what the day holds. But I want to make sure who's holding it. I don't be walking on my own steam, my own mind. I ain't just going to go out there and do whatever I want. God, guide me, order my step, change my day. I'm weak. But you're strong. First Corinthians tells us in chapter 1, verse 25 and 26, but because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Look, stop arguing passively with God. Stop going about your business and ask God what you need to be doing. If you're truly spiritual, he can order your step. Well, we don't want to be ordered. Then you don't want to be a saint. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. You better know this word better than that world. You better live this word better than the world. I don't care what you got, how much, what looks. I don't care about any of that, what paper you got on the walls. I don't want to mind the things of the flesh. I got to live in it enough. It's tr I'm weak enough. It's just struggle enough. God, I, I tell you what, God, I, I'm weak. God, I need you. That's why he says not many mighty, not many noble are called one of the, one of the greatest killers of God's people. And there's multiple warnings on the subject is pride. And we are prone to we try to hide or extinguish our weaknesses in order to portray strength. When really it's God's influence that makes the difference. 
That's why we turn around like Saul in utter amazement that he just killed the giant. He wouldn't dare face with a boy. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. And he said unto me, here's Paul. Remember the guy does all that stuff? We're going to read that in a second. My grace is sufficient for thee. Is it? When you're weak and it ain't going your way, is it? For my strength is made perfect. Thank God for your weakness right now. It's my daily reminder, God, I need you. I got to have you. I can't be bouncing around from service after service looking for a touch. Order my steps. Lead my, I'm weak. I can't allow my flesh to rise up in pride. Most gladly, therefore, Paul, what are you saying? I'm giving you a key here, folks. Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? When's the last time the power of God rested on you undeniably? Therefore, because of that, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Be thankful for your weaknesses. It guarantees God's help. You want to get God to turn his back on you? Act like you got it all by yourself. I can't do this without him. I don't want to walk without you holding my hand. I, I don't care what the day holds as long as God's holding me. You want to find out people that don't freak out, they understand their weaknesses and that God is in control. Thank God for my weaknesses, it guarantees his help. He's drawn to that vacuum of a need. But you get up, just get going on, dude. You don't ask God about this. You don't ask God. You just roll. Well, this is not a church. Are you out of your mind? Aren't you a church thing? Oh. We want the title in the church. And the power it brings in here. them off the moderation of it. Our weaknesses helps us to do the very thing that Jesus does. Value others. You want to find out how much bad God you are? You value others. Not just your family, not just your friends, but souls. You want to know you got the heartbeat of God? Souls will matter because you will value them because you'll remember how weak you are without him. Mm -hmm. You know how you make a strong rope? Not with one solid cord. Not by putting a whole bunch of strands together. That's the value of unity. That's the value of a church family. We're all weak in different ways and at different times, but we're strong together. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Mm -mm -mm. Romans 14 and 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. We're not here to question the word of God or question how to live for God. Look, you got a weakness? Come on, let me help you get strong. You got an issue there? Let me help you when I can. Hey, y'all, he's not heavy. He's my brother. I'm here. Remember this. Listen, this is weak in the faith. This is not giving in in the flesh. There's a difference. It's the weak and the strong. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Come on in, man. We love you. But don't, you can't stay, you can't bring that mess in here. You come in here to be cleansed 
from unrighteousness. We don't want to split the church over, well, they're doing this to Bobby. They're doing, oh, no, 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 no. We got to be in one mind accord in the word, and you'll be, you'll, you, you can be made strong. Not in, not, not in sin, but in him. 2 Corinthians 11, 29, 30. Who's Paul? Who is weak and I'm not weak? He's dealing with these guys. Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern mine infirmities. Sadly, we get to talking to one another. We won't brag about what we've done. But Paul tells us something in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, and you'll hear pastor speak this and quote this all the time because if you're going to have the, a heart after God, a mind after God, and, and you want to be anointed after God, to the weak become I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. You want to know what the greatest thing your weakness gives you? A ministry. The moment you get too strong for who you really are, you're going to lose your ministry. And we all have one. Oh, well, I guess I'm just out. I guess I'm just retired. I guess I'm just done. I guess I'm not good. No. Get back to being the weak person you are. The more you need God, the more you pursue God, the more you desire God, the more you get God. And all of a sudden, let the weak say, I am strong in the Lord. God didn't put us on the earth to live for ourselves but for people. Your greatest ministry will flow out of your weakness. Your greatest life message is going to come out of your deepest hurt. The very thing that causes you the most grief and pain, God will use as a message to other people to encourage them. God didn't bring you through that so you can brag about what you got or to be a show off. That's not what he did for it to glorify you. Listen to this. Don't hide what God's done for you. Matthew chapter 5, 14 and through 16. You are the light of the world. Who? Who? The saints of God. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and they give it light unto all, light, light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you. No. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. God pulled you out of the nothingness and God took us all and pulled us off the streets and out of the gutter and out of, out of homelessness or out of the poor house or out of whatever. The thing you're most embarrassed about The thing you're most ashamed of. The thing you don't want no one to know. That's what God wants to use to encourage others that are in that. Hebrews 11 says in verse 32, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. Who? through faith, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. God uses weak people. He turns weakness into strength. The, the stuttering Moses. Anger was Moses' greatest weakness. He killed an Egyptian, broke those tables of stone, smote the rock twice. Yet only he and Jesus are called meek in the Bible. And meek literally means anger and being controlled. David lusted, lusted after another man's wife, committed adultery with her, and then had him killed. But later he's called a man after God's own heart. Then God turned that weakness into strength. Abraham is called the father of faith. Hmm. But his greatest weakness was his lack of faith. Can you imagine he turned and said, Sarah, no! No way I believe God! How the story might have gone. How the world might be today. How many of us, oh, are you hearing me? 
Hallelujah. In fact, one time his wife pretended to be his sister because he doubted that God would protect him from the enemy that might want him. <laughs> Gideon, when God wanted Gideon to become Israel's deliverer from the Midianites, he, God called him a mighty man of valor. Gideon was hiding from the enemy. You know this story. But how many know God still used him? What's that telling you? What's that telling you about weakness? Jesus called Peter a rock, but he was anything but stable. He was impulsive. He was violent, which led him to denying the Lord, cursing him. But look at him on the day of Pentecost after God turns his weakness to strength. Jacob was a deceiver, a manipulator, and a schemer. In fact, he made one mess after another, and he always ran from it. He basically was running his entire life. He was a scoundrel. He was a liar. He was a turncoat. Until the night he wrestled with God. He said, I'm not letting you. I'm not letting you go. I'm not running with you, God. I'll not let you go until you bless me. And God said, okay, now I've got you to stop running. I'm going to take your weakness, and now I'm going to bless you. And he touched Jacob at his greatest point of strength. And he said, hey, you ain't running, boy. And forever after, he's going to walk with a limp as a reminder. I'm blessed because I'm weak. Oh, to have a constant reminder to depend on God, our own experience. Whatever that pain is, whatever it is that you went through that you want to hide or you have bottled it up. Maybe you gotten bitter at God or bitter at the church or think maybe God failed you. That's the point I was trying to bring out. There's your greatest ministry right there in that weak spot, in that painful spot. You would be mighty and awesome and powerful in the hands of God Amen. if you'd be honest in the weak place. If you want to have a Christ-like ministry, which means other people will be helped, encouraged, and healed by the wounds that you suffered in your life. Jesus received wounds in his body that we benefited from. And if I'm to be like Jesus, I stand. You tuck it, you hide it. God doesn't want that. That city that's set on it, he places you there to tell. Not about you. I should be here, but I am. That's the glory of God. Everything in my life, everything that I've been through, everything. I can't make it without it. I'm weak. But I'm still here because of the glory of God. What's the personal bottom line for each of us today? I would encourage you. as an excuse as to why you can't do anything for God. It may be the very thing he wants to use to bring glory to himself. You know, we all need a little encouragement. Joel 3 and 10, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And I want to close this down with Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Hast thou not Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, 
the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not. Can I tell you something? Satan trembles when he sees even the weakest saint on their knees. He trembles when he sees us realize not what I can do, but I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Watch me, old devil, when I put myself down on my knees in front of God and everybody to let the whole earth know I need God. And when me and God get it together, there are kingdom, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. They laughed at Nehemiah's wall and his efforts. They, 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 they mocked God. David as he faced Goliath. Pharaoh disregarded Moses. Paul was called mad and even Jesus was mocked on the cross. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can't see. It's what the Lord has done for me. Why don't we talk?